Hello to the Guadalupe Radio family. So good to be with you this afternoon. And no, you are still on the right station. This is not Al Cresta, as you can quickly gain. I am Toya Hall. I'm the Vice President of the Guadalupe Radio Network. And we are bringing you a very special, um, it's not quite an hour, but uh, almost. Uh, we finished up the Divine Mercy, so we are on on the air in studio in the Midland Odessa offices at KLPF, and I am joined by two very special people. Lynn Oswald, who is the president of the Guadalupe Radio Network, is here with me. Lynn? It's good to be with you, Toya, and uh, you know, it's such a blessed afternoon because we've got a very special guest. Yes, we do. This may be uh, the second day of Lent, but we're going to celebrate because in studio we have with us our new bishop, Bishop Michael Sis. Welcome to the West Texas area. Thank you. It's good to be with you. We are thrilled to have you here. Did you have a good drive up? Yeah, it was a beautiful drive. I drove very early this morning and I came to a meeting in this area of all the priests and the deacons and the sisters in this deanery. We had a great meeting. I saw two of our parishes, and now I'm here at the studio. Mm. Wonderful. So you were in Stanton. That's where St. Joseph, that's my parish. One of yeah. the, I think it's one of the older parishes in the diocese. It is. That parish of Stanton was the source of ministry in the Catholic Church for Midland Odessa back in the 1800s. And then, of course, Midland Odessa has passed them up by now. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Uh, we want to give you this opportunity, as well as Lynn and I are going to have the opportunity to get to know the bishop a little bit better. So, uh, Your Excellency, we wanted to ask you a few questions that we thought probably our listeners would like to know. Would you share with us about your upbringing and your family? I mean, everybody wants to know, how do you get a priest? Very good. Well, I grew up in the town of Bryan, Texas. Bryan College Station is about 100 miles north of Houston. We moved there when I was six years old because my dad got a job at Texas A&M University. And so that's my hometown. I'm the fourth of five children, and my mom and dad are very active Catholics. So all the time I was growing up as a child, we were very active in our parish. In fact, my mom was the director of religious education in the parish. And my dad eventually became a deacon, but that was after some years had gone by. And so the reason we came to Texas at all was because my dad is a professor of veterinary medicine. And so many of the veterinarians all across Texas had my dad as their anatomy professor. They might remember Dr. Ray Sis. So I grew up there. I went to Catholic school just for the first and second grade. And then from the third to the twelfth grade, I was in the public schools. And I had a great experience at both places. And so I was very active in my high school. I was a member of student government, the band, and I was also very active in our parish. We had a very active youth ministry program there with catechesis and a very good youth group. And so being so involved as a teenager in that parish really set the stage for me to be open to the vocation of the priesthood. At what point in your life did you know that you had this calling to the priesthood? Well, it was a long process of trying to figure that out. The first person to ever recommend it to me was the associate pastor of our parish in Bryan. His name was Father Raymond Bresna, and I was just 13 years old. And I was there at the parish with my mom, and the priest said, Mike, how old are you? I said, 13. He said, when I was 13, I entered the seminary. <laughs> you need to think about the seminary, because the priesthood is a great life, and I highly recommend it. So that was the first person to ever mention it to me. Mm -hmm. And then in the summers, we would go, me and some of the other teenagers from my parish, we would go to a summer vocation awareness program at the seminary in Houston. And the program was called Explore. And I really enjoyed that. For three different summers, when I was 13, 14, and 16, I would go with my classmates, and we would attend this about four or five day summer camp sort of thing. And it was just a wonderful opportunity for me to explore what God might want from me. Then I went to college at Notre Dame in Indiana as a regular lay student. 
And while I was there, I prayed and discerned, and I had a spiritual director. And I entered into the seminary my second year of college at Notre Dame. And I was in the seminary for seven years before I got ordained a priest. And when you go into the seminary, you're not sure whether you're going to be a priest or not. You go into the seminary in order to discern more fully, more completely. So I went into the seminary, open to the priesthood, but not quite sure what God wanted from me. And after I had been in the seminary about five years or so, then it became clear to me, this really is what I'm here for. Beautiful. Explore. I wonder if they still do that. Yeah, I think they do. Mm-hmm. That's great. You know, talking about vocations, <clears throat> during your time at St. Mary's in, at Texas A&M University in College Station, tremendous growth in the number of vocations. And, you know, people have characterized it as the vocations powerhouse. What do you attribute the significant increase in vocations out of Texas A&M to? Well, the beautiful thing about Texas A&M is that the kinds of families that send their students, their children to Texas A&M tend to be families with a strong sense of family values and spirituality and appreciation for tradition. That's the kind of families that are attracted to that university. And so all across the board with the various religious groups there, there's a large number of people who go into ministry. The Jews, the Baptists, the Methodists, the Catholics. So it's not just a Catholic thing. Mm -hmm. It's just very common for young people from Texas A&M to go into some form of ministry. There's a high level of religiosity on the campus of A&M. And so the Catholics are one of the groups that produce lots of ministers. And of course, there at St. Mary's Catholic Center, where I was the pastor for 13 and a half years, we built on that. But even before I got there, there was a strong tradition of, of vocations to the priesthood and the religious life from A&M. And we just kept adding to it and, and building on it. And what, so we had a real purposeful, intentional strategy to try to build a culture of vocations there. And it started with our staffing of our campus ministry. We very clearly sought to have young, well-trained people on our campus ministry staff so that they could connect well to the students and challenge the students academically, intellectually, and, and show through their joyful living of their life that serving God in the church is a wonderful thing to do. And so we, we always tried to make sure that we would have plenty of priests and sisters and deacons with a great love for their own vocation, living it out joyfully, presenting the basic truths of the Catholic faith. And that's what we did. We just presented basic Catholicism, very sacramentally based, lots of catechesis, and lots of development of student leaders. Because if young people only get their faith presented to them on a silver platter and never exercise leadership, then they never envision themselves in a role of leadership in the church. But if they, as young people, experience themselves in some role of leadership, then they're able to envision themselves possibly doing that full-time sometime. Mm -hmm. So that was the kind of strategy that we pursued there. Do you think some of those learnings from your experiences at Texas A&M and St. Mary's can be applied to the vocations program here in the Diocese of San Angelo? Oh, yeah. And I think it starts with a strong commitment to youth ministry in our parishes. Mm -hmm. And it includes an intentional involvement of young people in all aspects of the life of a parish. So that means everybody in a parish making room for young people to be involved, not just on the receiving end, Mm -hmm. but also on the giving end of life in a parish. And of course, it also means a strong commitment of all of us to campus ministry, making sure that we have well-staffed, good facilities at our universities and colleges, because we have a lot of them here. And that's a great resource for the future of the church. It also involves a certain 
attitude that's lived by the priests and the deacons and the sisters and the married couples and single people who are serving in the church, where they're, they're appreciating their own vocation and how that fits into all of the life of the church. And it involves living their roles of service with holiness and joy and being available to young people when they're needed. Another thing that we can do here is establish vocation committees in all of our parishes where there's a group of volunteers in the parish whose goal is to constantly look for ways to build a culture of vocations in that parish. And when you're doing those kinds of things and you're coordinating with the vocations office of the diocese, then things start to happen. Sparks start to go off and uh, the culture builds exponentially. That's wonderful. You know, Your Excellency, um, I I worked for 17 years in youth ministry, and I found that young people want to be invited. And if you set the bar high and challenge them, I see every time that they rise to that challenge. So shaping young people, I think, is so important in this era. So then the other way around is how, in working with these young people over the years, shaped you as a priest? Well, most of all, what it's done is given me great hope for the future of our Catholic faith. When you work with young people and you see their enthusiasm and they're embracing the faith and the ways that they seek to live out the tradition joyfully, creatively, energetically, it gives you great hope for the future. Mm -hmm. And so anybody who has the privilege of working with young people typically comes away with that kind of hope. From your past, what are some of the spiritual mentors that have, have impacted your life? My number one main mentor is Jesus. And he's the one that's the very center of my whole life. Others that have been really important for me have been St. Augustine of Hippo, because he was a local pastor and bishop, and, and he applied his mind and his deep faith to forming the faith lives of his people. Another one has been St. Thomas Aquinas because he so logically put together the different areas of thought with our faith tradition in a way that fits in a beautiful construction. And uh, he just gave a great service to all of us. Another very important one in my faith life is Francis of Assisi. I have a great devotion to Francis, and uh, he's just a very important model for me as a Christian. Another important one for me is St. Ignatius of Loyola because of his teachings about discernment and the spiritual exercises that he devised have been really important for me as an active person in the world trying to follow Jesus faithfully. Then, of course, people living in my time would include certain priests that had a great influence on me. Monsignor Don Sawyer, who's a Maronite priest in Austin, had a great influence on my decision to go into the seminary. Also, Father Frank Fairbairn was a priest in Boston. He had a great influence on me when I was in college. He's passed away. Monsignor Jim McNamara is a priest in the Rockville Center Diocese in New York, and he was my spiritual director when I was a seminarian in Rome, and he had a profound influence on my faith. And then a couple of the priests in my own diocese, the Austin Diocese where I was raised, that had a really strong influence on me, they've been mentors for me, have been Monsignor Victor Gertz and Father Kirby Garner and many others who just, they're way of living their faith as priests is so authentic and so committed that uh, it's just, they're great models for me. Now, if we come up to the current time, Your Excellency, and uh, because this is something I'm always kind of curious about, uh, because your world, your life has totally changed within a matter of a few months. And so in all different means of communication that we have today, 
How did you find out you were a bishop? I'm thinking they didn't text you, you know, or yeah. send you an email. How did you find out? How does that take place? Well, it was a regular working day. Uh-huh. It was a Monday afternoon. In, it was the 2nd of December of 2013. And I was there in my office in a meeting with our communications director, doing planning for some of our communications work in our diocese. Because at the time, I was serving as the vicar general in Austin. And we were in a meeting. And my administrative assistant knocked on the door to interrupt the meeting. And she usually doesn't interrupt unless there's something really important. So she said, it's the apostolic delegate on the phone. (laughs) And so I had to end that meeting. And I went and picked up the phone. And the apostolic delegate was calling from Washington. His name is Archbishop Carlo Maria Viganò. And he told me that, that the Holy Father, Pope Francis, has appointed me as the next bishop of San Angelo. And, of course, it was a big surprise. And uh, it was a challenge to try to respond to that. And I asked him if he would let me pray about it and get back with him. And he said, sure, you can pray about it and call me tomorrow morning And that'll give you a chance to think it through. So I did. Immediately what I did was go to our little chapel, because in our offices we have a a chapel with the Blessed Sacrament. And so I went there for about an hour, and just I brought my Bible, and I just prayed some of the fundamental Scripture passages that are really foundational to my own relationship with God. I prayed with those Scripture passages. And then I called my spiritual director, and asked if I could come and meet with him. And I went and met with my spiritual director and talked it over. That was very helpful, because it kind of helped to calm me down. Then I went back to my house, and I pulled out of my file some tools that I've been giving to young people for years and years for discerning major decisions in your life. And so I pulled out those tools which I had been giving to others, and I used them on this decision. Mm. I, I went, followed through the steps, the logical steps of these discernment tools, prayed it through, and looked at what it showed me, which was that it, it seems to be clear that I should say yes. And then I got a good night's sleep, <laughs> <laughs> which is always important with a major decision, to be able to sleep on it, right? Yeah. Right. Then I get up the next morning, And we have morning prayer and the Office of Readings and Mass, 7 o'clock on Tuesday morning, the 3rd of December. And in the Office of Readings, there's a passage from St. Francis Xavier, because that was his feast day. And you can go to the Office of Readings for the 3rd of December and read the passage that's there from Francis Xavier. And you read that and you say, man... Anybody reading that could not say no. Because St. Francis Xavier goes through and he's talking about his motivation to go and be a missionary. And his desire for others to say yes to that same calling. And he says, I just wish that more people would say to God, Lord, yes, send me, I'll go wherever you want me to go. And it was a, a real affirmation of what my discernment was indicating already. And then after that, I got in my car. I was going to a meeting, pulled out my cell phone. I called the apostolic delegate on the cell phone as I was driving. (laughs) I know you're not supposed to do that. (laughs) But I called him, and I said yes. And then the wheels started turning to get into action to get ready for the ordination. Can you share just a few of those tools? That is... That's so interesting. I'd love to see that and put it on our website. I can share those with you. Good. Yeah, of course, I can give you the documents, uh, the paperwork. I'll send them to you. Okay. Yeah. But I think, you know, discernment is one of the much-needed gifts of this day and age. So tools to work through how to make major decisions. Oh, yeah. That, and yeah, those are tools great. that basically they're strategies that come through centuries of wisdom, right? hmm And so I just sort of compiled them and and put them on paper. And uh, they're very helpful. They've been helpful to a lot of people. 
So you, yeah. you prayed and you worked through those, and then, you know, I just love to see the Lord work. Yes. And so the very next, even that evening, then you had a confirmation yes. for the next day. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, that's amazing. Because in the, in the midst of using the tool, you can see where it's leading. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we, we were so thankful you said yes. <laughs> well, I am too. <laughs> You know, uh, we play a program here on the Guadalupe Radio Network every morning from 5 in the morning till 7 o'clock in the morning, right before the live mass, and it's called the Sunrise Morning Show. And for for the last year, you know, a year and a half, you know, I, I get over here about somewhere between 5 and 5.30 in the morning, and there's a new segment as part of that Sunrise Morning Show, and they are always the first ones to let people know who the new bishops are that have been announced. Well, guess what? I wake up that morning, it's December 12th, and uh, I hear that Bishop Michael Sis has been selected as a new bishop, and I'm going, all right, who's Michael Sis? <laughs> so I had to do some research. And, uh, but I, in hindsight, the fact that that announcement was made on December 12th, which is the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, you know, a lot of people found significance in that. I did, and I know a lot of other people did. How about you, Bishop? Yes, in fact, we chose that date on purpose. Oh. We could have announced it any day within that week. Uh-huh. But we wanted to choose it. We wanted it to be announced on a day that was of special significance in our faith. Hmm. And so, of course, when we looked at the calendar, we thought, oh, December 12th is perfect. Yeah. She's a patroness of the Americas. She's a very important patron saint for me, too, personally. She's been a very important part of my journey as a priest. And so it was a natural choice for the day. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, it was perfect. The, the traditions of the church I always find so beautiful. And as, as Lynn and I followed uh, the, um, everything that, that took place in the news and and the installation mass and all, there's so many beautiful things of tradition that take place in the church. And one of the things that I thought was so interesting is your ring, your bishop's ring. Would, would you share with us about that? Because I don't think I, this is something I really knew about. Did you, Lynn? No. I knew they had one, but I didn't know how it came about. No. Yeah, every bishop is, is supposed to have a ring. In fact, in the ordination ceremony, there's a, a time when the ring is, is given by the one who's ordaining. And so I could have picked any sort of ring, really. There's not really uh, a clear guideline as to what the ring is supposed to be. And so I wanted it to be a ring that would have a crucifix on it instead of a gemstone. Uh, It's very, very common to see bishop's rings that are a gemstone. Often it's an amethyst. But I also know that people kiss the bishop's ring as a custom, and I would rather have someone kissing the crucifix than kissing an amethyst. And so I wanted a ring that would have a crucifix on it, and I wanted it to be the crucifix of John Paul II, because Pope John Paul II was integral in my own formation as a Catholic man, as a priest. And so I, would, I needed to find an, a ring that would have the, the crucifix of Pope John Paul II on it, and it was hard to find. I couldn't find any out there that were already made. Because there are a lot of people who sell rings like this. But I couldn't find one. There's one that's uh, popular in Texas that uh, is Martin Luther. Martin Luther. Yeah, it's the, the wedding ring of, of Martin Luther. And it has a cross that's going sideways across the finger. That's real popular. I thought about that one. Then there's another a company out in Colorado that makes rings that have a crucifix on it. It's also going sideways. And I thought about that too. Then I was sitting and talking with my mom and dad at their house in Bryan about my discernment for a ring. And so my mom goes and pulls out some old boxes of broken jewelry. And she's been around a long time, my mom and dad, and she, over the years, had various pieces of jewelry that had broken, and she never bothered getting them fixed because sometimes it's too expensive to fix it. So she had various old necklaces and rings and bracelets and pieces of things. And some of it, it's hard to tell whether it's gold or not. What is the metal? And so we kind of went, sorted through them and picked out some 
broken pieces that she wasn't using. And, and I also added to it an old gold crown from my own mouth wow. that the dentist had replaced <laughs> with a porcelain crown. And I had saved that. That's gold. You know, you can right. use that. So I took all these pieces to a jeweler in Austin. And he's a Catholic man. He understands bishop's rings and things. And so I took him the, the design that we used. The basic design looks like a bishop's miter. It's pointed on the top and right. flat on the bottom. And that shape of a ring is reminiscent of a ring that was given to all the bishops who participated in the Second Vatican Council. But on theirs, instead of a crucifix, they had a triptych of three little icons, Jesus, Peter, and Paul. But I wanted the crucifix. Mm -hmm. So I used the same shape as a Vatican II ring, but I got a crucifix on it. And so there was a, a jewelry artist in Austin. I gave him lots of photographs, and so they basically made that and they melted down these old broken pieces of gold that I gave them, and they made the ring. And so now every time I look at it, I think of my mom, yeah. who was the source of most of it, and also Pope John Paul II. And when people kiss it, it makes me more comfortable knowing that they're kissing the crucifix. Yeah. My what goodness, a, what a that has a lot of meaning to it. It does. Yeah. A lot of family significance, as you said, it reminds you of your mom. Speaking of your mom, let's talk about your dad. He's a deacon, and uh, he was involved with the ordination and installation of you as bishop, and that, that had to be very special. It was very special. From the very beginning, when we started to plan that liturgy, I knew that you're supposed to have two deacons, and I wanted my dad to be one of those two deacons. And, of course, he, he was very happy to be asked. He was ready to do it. And I don't know of any other bishop anywhere whose dad served as a deacon in his mass of ordination as a bishop. Yeah. Maybe there are some, but I've never heard of them. And so he proclaimed the gospel, and he was one of the two deacons who held the book of the gospels over my head in the ordination rite, which is a beautiful part of the ceremony. And so he had a very key role in the ceremony. He did beautifully. And it was a real joy for him and for me, for us to be together in that, especially since San Angelo is a completely new place for me. Mm -hmm. And so to have his involvement really connected personally, very, very deeply. And also it was an affirmation of my whole family. I had lots of relatives and brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, cousins who came from all over for that ceremony. And so for them to have him up there as well as me made it all that much more special. And I think it also delivered for all of us a clear message of the importance of dads in the development of young people. Uh, and so to anybody who's listening to this program today who is a dad or who has the opp opportunity sometime to become a dad, I hope you'll just think about how important your presence is in the development of your children and what a blessing it is for you to be personally involved in their faith life. Yeah. It had to be so emotional yeah. for your parents. Yeah. Yes, well, some it of the was. Pictures, some of the pictures in West Texas Angeles of you and your dad, they're so heartfelt. It's just wonderful. Now, another one of the, the aspects of being an, a new bishop is you choose a motto. And I thought yours was so appropriate for this time. Could you share about that with us? Yes, Usually the motto is something that's scripturally based, or sometimes it comes out of the liturgy of the church. And this is a passage from 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, which says, we are God's co-workers. In Latin, the phrase is dei sumus adiutores. In Spanish, it's somos colaboradores de Dios. And throughout my priesthood, I would often refer to that passage in my teaching and preaching because it captures so much about what it means to be a Christian, to be a co-worker in God's work. It connects to so many themes. It, it explains very well a very important part of our theology of grace, that uh, we cooperate with God's grace, and we need to cooperate with it. And it, it connects to the whole theme of ministry and service in the church. 
it, it also relates beautifully to how we explain the communion of saints. The communion of saints are not little gods or goddesses. They're human beings who are co-workers with God. And God gives us the privilege of sharing in his work, of, of saving people. It also connects to the, the beautiful call to intercessory prayer. That when I pray for people, I am God's co-worker. And that's an inspiration to do intercessory prayer and to ask for people's prayer. And finally, it relates to stewardship. It's a beautiful theological concept to be called to be stewards of God's gifts and to be co-workers with God in his ongoing work of creation, building a better world. And so in so many beautiful ways, that little phrase from St. Paul helps to put it all together for me as a Christian. And so I figured, well, that's, I've been using that statement so many years, I'll just go ahead and use that for my motto. It's beautiful. At your ordination and installation mass, you said, quote, today is the first day of the future that God wants to work in our lives together here. And tomorrow we get to work and we move forward together, each one of us doing our part to write the next chapter in the beautiful history of the church in this diocese. So we, we were wondering... How do you see Catholic Radio helping you in the diocese in writing that next chapter? Well, first of all, I think it's always good when you're thinking of Catholic Radio, it's always good to think of who's the patron saint of Catholic Radio, and that's St. Gabriel, the archangel. And what was Gabriel doing when he spoke to Mary in the Annunciation? He was communicating the good news of the incarnation of God. And that think, that's the scriptural basis for the ministry, that we're communicating the good news that comes from the incarnation of God. God chose to become a human being, and we proclaim that good news through all the different media. And so I think that's the foundation of it. Mm -hmm. And I think what's beautiful about Catholic radio is how it has the ability to connect all the different levels of living out our faith. It, can, it involves the individual personal faith. It involves family experiences of faith in the home. It includes parish-level faith practices. It also has an involvement on a diocesan level, connecting people to the life of the church in a diocese, and the whole universal church worldwide. And since we're called by our baptism to live out our Christianity on all those levels, the radio is one of those media that, that has the ability to do that because of the different programs you put on the radio. It helps people to live out their faith on all those levels. And that's a wonderful, holistic experience. Also, what Catholic Radio has a special opportunity to do in this part of the world is to connect the English and the Spanish speakers by offering this same message of faith in English and Spanish. It's a wonderful uniting instrument. It's a tool for bridging intercultural gaps. And I just think it has so much to offer. And then you look geographically how we're situated in this part of Texas. We have lots of space and the people are spread out, right? And radio is able to cover a lot of territory very efficiently and have everybody feel like they're connected. And we need that in a part of the world where people are so spread out. Yeah. Yeah. Now you were sharing with us before we went on the air that you were actually involved and applied for a radio license. That's right. There was a time when I was a pastor of St. Mary's in College Station where the U.S. government made available low-power FM licenses. And I thought, oh, that's a perfect opportunity for a university parish. Because there at Texas A&M, they have a communications department, but they don't have enough opportunities for students to practice on air. Mm -hmm. There's just not enough broadcasting time. And so we have the students who are energized for their faith. We have students who need on-air experience. 
and we have a message to deliver. And the license from the government was free. <laughs> Go and, figure. <laughs> yeah. And so we applied for it. We got in line, and it was a long wait. It took us probably four or five years before the government got back with us and said, yes. And of course, once they gave us a green light, we ran with it. And there were so many people in our town who were not even Catholics, but they just love radio. Mm -hmm. People who just believe in radio. And they were helping us. That one of them was a, a guy who had a station, a commercial station. He allowed us to use his tower to broadcast our message. Oh so it gave us a broader area, FM signal. Somebody gave us some equipment to use. And we had lots of volunteers. And the students jumped on board, and they just ran with it. And it's a lot of fun. That's wonderful. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been uh, five weeks now since your ordination and installation. What do you feel are some of the priorities uh, for the remainder of your first year as Bishop of San Angelo? One of the top priorities has already been established here, and that is family life and marriage. We want to do everything we can to support couples in forming and living healthy marriages and good, holy, healthy families. So family life and marriage already has been a top priority here, and we will continue that. That's very important. And of course, we, we know that uh, the Holy See is also pushing marriage and family life in a very strong way right now. The The... Pro-life message will continue to be a very strong message of this diocese because we have to keep building a culture of life and never let up on the gas. Because even though we've had some great success successes with decisions of the state legislature this past year, you can never let up because the culture around us is always going to be trying to threaten the precious gift of life. And we as Christians need to do everything we can to keep building in people's hearts a commitment to the respect of human life from conception to natural death. Also, a big priority for me is helping people to continue growing throughout their whole lives in understanding our faith so that they can share it with others in an understandable, convincing way. So a lifelong process of growth in understanding of the faith for children and adults is very important to me because our faith is such a gift and all we have to do is learn it and share it and more people will jump on board. Also, a priority for us will continue to be building bridges between cultures because we live here at the crossroads of cultures in West Texas. And we all need to be committed to building understanding and collaboration across language groups and cultural groups so that we can show the world how people of different ethnicities and languages can get along peaceably and productively. We can be a great model for that. Of course, Bishop Pfeiffer encouraged the diocese to regularly reflect on how we're living out the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. And we'll continue to emphasize that because that's just basic, consistent Catholic faith practice, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. And then finally, I just want to reemphasize the fact that all of us need to constantly seek to make room to include young people in the life of the church, especially at a parish level. Your Excellency, we thank you so much for being here with us. I, I think we're running pretty short on time. And so uh, I just want to give you the opportunity, if you have anything else that you would like to share, I want to tell people they can follow you on the website at sanangelodiocese.org and the Diocese of San Angelo Facebook page, too. That's right. And I'm sending out uh, tweets on Twitter. Wonderful. It's S.A. Bishop Mike. S.A. stands for San Angelo. S.A. Bishop Mike is my Bishop. Twitter account. And I'm sending out messages every day during Lent. It's very brief reflections. 
And I'll continue, I won't do it on a daily basis forever, but during Lent, it's every day. And finally, I just want to make one final observation, and that is that you who run this station are an example for the rest of us of the laity taking their role responsibly for spreading our message of faith. And I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you very much for those kind words, Your Excellency. Would you uh, mind giving a final blessing before we go off the air? Very good. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And one quick last announcement, if I could, Robert. Uh, Bishop Sis ordination is going to be aired on EWTN television this Saturday at 10 a.m. So if you want, if you weren't able to attend, you can watch it on EWTN Saturday at 10 a.m. Thank you so much, and thank you, Guadalupe family. Love being with you today. God bless you. This concludes a special presentation by the Guadalupe Radio Network, an interview with the Bishop of the Diocese of San Angelo, Bishop Michael Sis. We now return you to regular programming.